everybody. Thanks very much for uh, having us today. Um, so we're going to talk about HoloLab Champions VR, which is a game we're very excited about coming out on July 10th. Yep. Um, and if you get a chance, you can play it up on the second floor at the Marketplace. We learned a lot while we were doing this. And we're going to tell you about some of it today. So HoloLab Champions started out, we've been doing a lot of VR at Shell Games. Shell Games is a studio in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We have about 120 people doing a mixture of education games and entertainment games. And a couple years ago, we uh, started working on this thing called SuperChem. Some people might have seen it at Games for Change last year. We had an early demonstration of it. We applied for some IES grants. Uh, we got a phase one grant uh, for SuperChem and then phase two in order to turn it into a complete product. And a lot of things changed uh, over that time. Initially, we were just like, yeah, chemistry, VR lab, it's going to be great. And we set it in a sort of a spaceship theme because we thought that was cool and that would connect with students. And then we thought, we're going to turn this whole thing into a big space adventure game where you do chemistry in order to solve the problems. And as we were working on it, we'll talk about why we ended up pivoting away from the space adventure and into a thing that was more like a game show. And at that point, kind of like Harley came in and started doing a little more of the directing on that. So we'll show you the, uh, the trailer uh, for the game. Boop. Welcome to the greatest event in the galaxy. The traditional chemistry lab finally has a modern companion. Developed with input from chemistry teachers, HoloLab Champions is an immersive, safe, and entertaining environment that makes mastering lab skills fun. As game show contestants, players can perform a variety of lab challenges, leading to a show-stopping final lab. Or, in practice mode, they can hone their skills on specific tasks. Players are scored on accuracy and safety as they perform work that prepares them for success in a real lab. Power Lab Champions is the chemistry lab companion you've been waiting for. So we learned an awful lot uh, while we were working, working on this. Things about chemistry education, things about virtual reality. And uh, so we thought we'd break it down into lessons learned. So one of the first lessons that we learned is that it's really easy to underestimate ordinary things. Yep, I'm supposed there to go, go that now way. you got it. All right, new clicker. Um, <clears throat> Easy to underestimate an ordinary thing like that. So uh, one of the best examples of this is a chemistry lab notebook. Um, it's in every chemistry lab. Everywhere that kids learn how to do chemistry lab practice, there, there's notebooks. Um, and so we thought, well, that'll be something that we will do and we will support. Um, and it turns out that there are a lot of challenges in implementing something like this in a way that, uh, that is really relevant and useful. Um, and so I'm going to show you a little video of, uh, of what we ended up with and then talk about some of the challenges that we had getting there. Uh, so this is our chemistry lab notebook in the game. Um, and it is uh, really integral to the experience. The player needs to get an enormous amount of information out of it. It needs to be readable, it needs to be usable, they need to be able to page through it. All of these are problems that we had to solve. Um, and then there's some of the extra added stuff, like players don't actually want to read very much. And it's hard to read in VR. You know, we had, we had to uh, go to much higher res and larger fonts than we initially in, uh, assumed uh, in order to make these things readable. So you can see, the amount of information the player has to be able to parse and find is, is pretty spectacular given uh, the skills that we're asking them to practice. And I'll, I'll give you an example uh, so you can really see. This is an example of our, our instructions for how to do a flame test. There's a huge amount of information that we had to make accessible to players and we had to draw their attention to the thing. So that's just one example of many ordinary things that we, we really had to put more effort in than we initially assumed to make it usable and accessible for our players. Yeah, so the, the notebook was a really big deal. I mean, it was something we really learned from teachers that you can't do a chemistry lab without notebook. Notebook is key and crucial. And so we ended up putting a lot of time in on that. Another thing we ended up putting a lot of time in on was 
fluids, because if you're going to do chemistry lab in VR, you've got to do real-time fluids, which of course is one of the difficult unsolved problems in the world of real-time simulation. Check out this amazing fluid simulation we made. Look at this. Look at this, all happening in real time in so VR. Cool. We beat our brains out really trying to figure out the right way to get excellent fluid simulations. We're unable to use any of that in the game. Um, that cool thing, it's like in the lobby when you start the game, you can fiddle with that. But all the other fluid simulations we do in the game don't use a system that advanced because we could not find a way to support the whole game and those fluid simulations without degrading frame rate. And in VR, your frame rate's got to be 90, 90 frames a second. And if you don't, people start to get motion sick. So you really have to burn a lot of energy on that. So the actual fluid system that we use in the game is a combination of four different systems all cleverly like working with each other to get the feeling of fluids because we have to simulate things like a meniscus and when I pour things the right way and, and a drip coming off a lip and like all of, all of those things was a, took a huge amount of energy. And of course one of the Difficult fluid things was the nature of working with a pipette. A pipette, you know, for drawing uh, fluid up and then measuring it and kind of putting it in another container. We thought, okay, sure, that'll be easy to figure out how to do in VR, and it wasn't at all. Initially, we assumed that using a more pipette like this, it's got this little pump, it's got a switch on it, that we'll do it just like that. We'll use the Vive controller the same way by having your thumb scroll up and down just like it scrolls on a real pipette. No, that totally didn't work because of the nature of the disc on the Vive. When you put your thumb too close to the edge, nothing happens. It just was a big fail. We ended up using the method you see here where it's a modal change. When you put your, your, your uh, pipette in the liquid, the button does one thing. When you have your pipette out of the liquid, the button does another thing. It took, we did, I think, what, four different versions before we had one that actually works. Here you can see a player in action actually drawing from the pipette, making use of it. But boy, the amount of iteration that it took in order to make this work properly uh, was difficult. And it was, it was a real challenge. We, we had some very serious conversations about when is the go, no go for the pipette? When do, we, yep. when do we say we can't make it high enough quality for our players and our users to be able to learn what they need to learn uh, and say we're just going to have to cut it? And very fortunately, uh, you know, different people on the team brought different solutions and the combination of them really worked. But it was really last minute that that happened. Yep. Yeah. And here's another one that you totally take for granted the nature of a counter. So um, when you do measurement in chemistry, very often you're looking at a graduated cylinder. And the idea is you want to look at the cylinder to figure out how many milliliters of fluid are there here. But every chemistry teacher will tell you, don't pick it up because you won't be holding it right. You need to put it on the surface and then you need to kind of lean down and look at it so that you know it's completely level. And one of the things that happens when you lean down on a chemistry bench is you put your hand on it so that you can lean down comfortably. Because if you don't put your hands on it, it's like you're doing squat thrusts the whole time you're in chemistry lab. It's very exhausting. Well, guess what? Our virtual lab bench, you can't touch it, right? So people are having to do these squat thrusts in the whole game, and it was really frustrating. And the solution we came up with, if you look up here at the top, you can see we, we made this very strange looking high part of the counter. And the reason for that is, that way, if you can just place it more at eye level and take a look without having to crouch down. But it took a long time to kind of figure out these things because they're, they're just, they're not obvious. The, the most natural things are the toughest to simulate. So one of the other things that we discovered is that VR, for some people, really amplifies stage fright. And we think that this is a combination of not being able to see your audience, so you can't see their reaction. Um, but also, VR in and of itself, there's this huge cognitive load. And that means that uh, a lot of people have, uh, they're, they're just much more exposed to the fear of looking stupid. Um, now, our, our user base for this, our guests, are our middle schoolers and high schoolers. And guess who's really at the highest part of the ramp in their lives for fear of looking stupid? Um, we... Uh, at some point during our playtesting, we realized we hadn't really gotten very many girls in to playtest, that almost all of our playtesters had been boys, and so we made a big effort to get girls in, 
And uh, we'd been asking along the way because we wanted, to, we wanted to know that we were hitting our guests' expectations and that this was, this was something that they liked. Who is this game for? And uh, when we play tested the girls, they said, yeah, this game is for me and I would really enjoy it and I would, re I would really play it. And then we said, would you play it in class in front of your peers? And some of them said yes, but some of them said absolutely not. Um, and, and it really highlighted to us how much the <clears throat> separation from reaction, plus that special time in your life when these things are super important to you, uh, really highlighted to us how much that was a problem for them. Yeah, and so this, and for other reasons, initially we were very focused on you use this in class, in front of the class, the class works with you to solve the problems in there. And we found ourselves pivoting more to, you know, this seems to be stronger when you go and do it privately in, in private settings. There's still ways to do it in class, but it's, it's a lot tougher. Yeah. One of the small things, just talking about this, is the, the business of the timer. With time pressure isn't a big deal in this game, but we wanted a little bit of time pressure, mainly for people who played it a lot, so that they had a way to continue their mastery. Could I do these things not only safely and correctly, but quickly? And initially, our timer was near the front. You can see there's the host and there's the timer off to one side. And later we realized that's creating too much time pressure. And so we put the timer way off to one side, like way, way off to the right. And one of our sound designers had a brilliant idea the timer, you can't hear any ticking or anything unless you look at it. And if you don't even look at it, you don't even know that it's there. So for the people who care about it, they can pay attention. But for people who don't care about it, it's kind of like it's not there. A big important lesson, of course, probably a lesson on every educational game project involving schools, teacher input is absolutely crucial. We had multiple times that our project was changed radically by teacher input. Um, this is a picture of uh, Catalina Akeem, who has been an excellent advisor for us on this project. She's that rare combination of chemistry professor who's also an expert in teaching chemistry at a high school level. So we worked with her. We also worked with a lot of you know, active uh, high school teachers, and we learned so many things. Like one of the big ones for us was initially we were very focused on chemical reactions. You know, this is going to be a constructivist way for kids to combine their chemicals and learn the way around, like what combined with what makes what reaction. And we talked to teachers and they're like, we don't know, that's not important in chemistry class. What's important is just understanding how to be safe and use lab equipment properly. And so that was a big pivot. So things like a scale, like how do you properly use a scale? Just being able to get the muscle memory of how do you do that? And even little things, like here's our, here's our first pass at a scale, and teachers kind of shook their head a little bit, like, yeah, um, you've got some things that are wrong um, about this scale. And so here's the revised scale. Um, Can you see the difference? Uh, so this had actually come up in play tests, and we'd noticed it, but we didn't know what to do about it. Um, with, three, with three places after the decimal point, we found that people were spending a huge amount of time trying to get exactly the right amount. And remember, this is a simulation, and so the fineness of our simulation, had we, we kept dialing it up and up and up, trying to give them that control. And then the teachers came in and they said, well, we only want two decimal places because our labs don't have more than two decimal places, and we think that that's going to confuse and stress people out. And we said, hey, you know what? It is confusing and stressing people out, and so we dialed it back to only having two decimal places. Yeah. And we had to make some pretty, pretty fundamental changes in, in, in our sort of level design in order to accommodate that, but it did, it did definitely help. Yep. Another big one for us was um, we are trying to make a game that's engaging and has flow through that you'd want to play for a long time. Teachers are much more interested in, look, if I'm going to use this in school, I need to get to the part I care about when I care about it and have it be as undistracting as possible. So we ended up making two modes here. You see play mode, which kind of plays the main game, and practice mode that lets you jump to any one of the little tiny sub micro labs and just do that without all the crazy distraction that kind of happens in the game show mode of the game. Yeah. And related to that, man, classrooms, they are not totally ready for VR yet. Yeah. Classrooms really need a ramp up to VR. So this is Laura, one of the producer on the project, uh, standing in the space, the only space in the room where there was enough room to set up anything remotely like the VR space. Because it takes a bit, of, a bit of space. You know, you see these are the 
the, uh, the towers up here, and we in our testing had assumed kind of maybe a uh, six foot diameter space that you would be able to move around in freely, and that's not really a luxury that a lot of uh, classrooms have a space even that large. Yep. And, and they need a lot more than that, too. Yeah, so uh, we had multiple people spend huge amounts of time working on this document, our classroom guide, um, which basically uh, is curriculum support, it's troubleshooting support, it's ideas for how you can do classroom management, it's uh, details about the lab equipment that we feature. Um, uh, this document, you only see the first 57 pages in the table of contents here. This document is about 80 pages long. Um, and this is, this is what we felt was sort of the minimum support needed for teachers to be able to download this game and integrate it into their, into their classes. Um, uh, and it was, it was a huge amount of work. Uh, multiple people uh, contributed uh, to it. Uh, and, and this is the sort of thing that, that probably you should expect if you're doing uh, VR work for classrooms to support any kind of standardized curriculum. You should plan to do this amount of work uh, in your, in your, uh, in your uh, materials and support. And this, is, this is something that people can download from our website. The thing that really uh, became clear to us is that we needed to support teachers very strongly here, right? And so we spent all this time and energy to support teachers, and, uh, and we felt really good about that. They liked the game, they understood how to use it, they even understood how to set it up after they read, that, read our instructions. Yeah. Um, and that was, that was good, we felt like that was a win. Yeah, yeah. And, and we got very focused on teachers and what teachers wanted, and in fact, we got so focused on it that we lost sight of something very important. And this is our fifth lesson here, that the expert that you use for your game is not your player. Uh, we love teachers dearly. Teachers are absolutely essential to what we do, and, um, and they're gatekeepers of the classroom. But what teachers are not, teachers are not students. And this became really important because part of our goal here was to make a game that was very engaging. This was not meant to be just useful in the classroom. This was meant to be something so engaging that people with VR systems at home would say, wow, I went and did that chem lab thing just because it was super fun. So we needed both. It was, it was partly a requirement of the grant. It partly the, it seemed, feels like the right way to make something be very successful. We were modeling ourselves after things like Kerbal Space Program, a game which is super fun to do like rocketry with, but also physics teachers use it in classrooms. We were trying for the same thing. Thing. So when we went for this game show thing, we went for jokes. Like, let's do a lot of kind of fun, silly jokes in here. And we put a bunch in. They're like, yeah, these are the sorts of things teachers would like. And we'd show them to the teachers. And like, yeah, that's hilarious. We love these chemistry jokes. And then we like play some kids play tests. And like the kids are just rolling their eyes. And we're like, what's wrong with it? They're like, oh, this is like stuff my science teacher would say. And we're like, oh, oh yes, my God, fact, you're right. My science teacher did say. <laughs> what are we doing? So we ended up doing a big change to the style of the game by ch we, we shifted to a multi-level style. We ended up trying to go for humor that kind of had intellectual side to it, but also a very subversive, kind of a rule-breaking uh, side to it. So here's, here's just a little example of like one of the lines in the game. It's a lean, mean, scooping machine. Or simple tool. I mean, it really, it's just a glorified spoon, but sciencey. Right, so the, the initial line from what that was in the original game was like, you, you do some scooping, and like the commentator would be, it's a lean, mean, scooping machine. And that was the whole thing. And kids would kind of roll their eyes. But then, with a lot of these lines, we found that then by adding kind of a, well, actually, it's just a spoon, you know, just, but science-y, eh. You know, by having these things that were kind of uh, breaking and subversive, then you could get a laugh out of the kids. And it was funny for so many of these, we'd watch the teacher laugh at the first part, and then when the, when the host is like, man, that sure was stupid, I'm embarrassed that I said that, uh, then the kid would, would laugh at that. And in fact, to this end, we did two different trailers. So we showed you the educator's trailer uh, with uh, Sabrina Solba was the narrator. She was the, the, uh, spent a lot of the time in the directing on this project. And uh, now we're gonna show you the second trailer, which is aimed much more at a kind of a gamer audience. Welcome to the greatest event in the galaxy, where lab is the name and chemistry is the game. Your host for this lab extravaganza is me, Earl, and my assistant, Meyer. This isn't your one-of-the-mill, interdimensional holographic chemistry showdown. I can guarantee that. 
have what it takes? Get your brain immortalized as a Hollow Lab Champion! What? That's not weird, is it? It's just your brain. So there you go. So thanks very much. Our hosts have me yanked us off the stage, so maybe we have time for a couple questions. Hello. Yeah. Um, I played it upstairs, and I had two little uh, detailed UI questions. Yes. Um, the, the fact that your hands are the controllers. Yes. Did you play with real human hands and controller hands, if you know what I mean? Right. So question, of, as opposed to using uh, controllers, is there a way to kind of just track empty human hands? Or, no, when you're holding the controller, uh, the graphic for oh. the in-game thing looks like a controller. Right. Did you experiment with it looking like your hand? Right. We've, we've tried a few different things there. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we didn't in this game, but because we have made games in which that is the case, um, uh, we have some experience with it. We, we didn't, we chose not to do it in this game specifically because we knew that in classrooms, people were going to be a lot more naive to VR, and having a graphic of the thing they're actually holding in their hand would help sort of normalize them to the right. world. Yeah, what, what does my so. controller look like? Well, you can look at it and know. Right. Secondly, the business of getting a hand to properly grasp the different things the right way and not look strange mm -hmm. um, is, is difficult. And right. so we, we, this is the way we've gone for, for the moment. It, yeah. It's simpler and it hasn't been a problem. And uh, the... Um, TV camera kind of character yes. that flies around. Could you talk about that? I, while playing it, I was like, oh, what, 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 why is that thing looking at me? And right, I was right, right. By it. So we, we were kind of going for two, two things here. First, uh, we were very sensitive to the no notion of this being used in classrooms, the, um, that the idea that a student might do a demonstration that everyone in the classroom is to watch. But the first person demonstration isn't always the best way to watch that. So we liked the idea of being able to have a second camera up on the screen, which is different what the person sees here, so that you could set it in different places. So if we're going to have that, we need a control system to do it. And since we were going for the game show thing anyway, we liked the idea of like, well, if we're going to have multiple cameras set up, let's just go all in on that. And then further, we realized when, once we changed that tone, yeah. and we needed to kind of go and have the host be a little sarcastic, he needed someone to be sarcastic too. So we ended up making, you know, so he's Earl, and then this is Meyer as the cameraman, and so he's talking to the cameraman, and the and the the camera's floating around, and you have a panel you can switch around. So that's how we ended up there. I just got the sign that we need to wrap up. So all right, I I think I think I, I know how they get that sign. All right, so thanks very much, everybody, and it's up on the second floor. If you want to try it out, it will be available to download on July 10th, but you can add it to your Steam wish list now. Thanks very much.